Sanjeev, a quick follow-up on that, and this is to you as an economist who's been outside government and now in the government for several years. Why does a large economy like India not have a comprehensive government-published set of employment numbers? It's not rocket science, and we excel at that, by the way. Why don't we have that as yet? So this will have to be the last question, because as you know, I have, I have to one on more. another interview. One more and then last. Uh, but uh, let me say that... Uh, Okay, literally one more after this. But so the thing is that, uh, well, it actually is a somewhat more complicated than rocket science because there are many shades of gray in employment in India in general because, you know, uh, there's a lot of informality. Uh, people are doing a lot of part-time jobs. Uh, you know, they're working in agriculture part of the time. They're working in uh, wage earnings, uh, salaries in other time points of the year, and so on. So this has been a tricky issue for a long time, long debate on this issue. But oddly enough, this is actually going to become even more complicated into the future for not just us, but for the world. Because when you're taking into account, for example, significant proportion of the uh, workforce doing gig economy. Now, then, you know, how do you define a gig uh, 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 worker as a worker or not. So there will be all kinds of complications on this data front. It's a, it's a longer debate, not meant for a quick debate on television like this. Many people are watching at this time, Sanjeev, uh, are wondering what the government will up ultimately do on regulating digital currencies. There was a bill which was to come which was kind of held back. So we won't get into the specifics of what happens, but can you explain your thinking as principal economic advisor? Can you explain as best as you understand the thinking within the finance ministry on what would be the right approach and how to deal with uh, cryptocurrencies? Well, as far as crypto is concerned, uh, this is a matter that is being uh, debated extensively both in parliament and in the Ministry of Finance. Uh, we appreciate the risks that uh, many experts, including the Reserve Bank, has raised about uh, to the financial stability and the impact of that. We are also watching keenly in what's happening to other countries, like what is happening in, for example, El Salvador that adopted bitcoins. Uh, so we are very, very open. Uh, we are very, very cognizant of the risks to uh, 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 for, uh, emanating from uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. At the same time, we appreciate that there are certain innovation-related um, benefits as well. Uh, so, you know, let me not uh, uh, step in where, frankly, uh, a debate is still being going on, and I am sure we will get a much clearer picture about our thinking in the very new future. Okay, so as promised, last question to you, Sanjeev, and this is about imports from China. Ever since no, the I'm Galvan afraid, clashes, I literally have one, to one last question, Sanjeev. One last question. One I know you need to bold, but one last question. So very quickly. No, on I the... really know nothing about Galvan. No, no. Clashes. Hear my question. Hear my question. It's got nothing to do with Galvan. My question is on imports from China. After all the restrictions the government put in place on Chinese investments in telecom and elsewhere, one would have assumed that there would be a dip in imports coming from China. Instead, numbers are going up. Why is that happening? How do you see that? And to what extent do you think we've so, been able to move away from importing from China? So first of all, we can't wish away China. I mean, we do trade with them. We, have, uh, we import and export with them. And they are an important part of the world economy. So we can't wish them away, and certainly not in any short time frame. Uh, what we can do is not get, you know, protect our national interests in various ways. For example, by not uh, participating in RCEP, for example. So we have built some ways in which to protect our national interests. But at the same time, we, you know, we can't wish away the fact that China is an important part of the world economy, and we have to engage with them at the same time. So that is where we are at. Uh, it's, a, it's an evolving uh, thing in which, uh, obviously, we will take uh, in the longer run, hopefully we will be able to build enough, enough capacities for certain inputs for which we are dependent on, not just China, but other countries as well. You know, there's a lot of effort, as you know, on Atmanirbhar Bharat and others, uh, creating chip capacities in India, pharmaceutical in ingredients. But obviously, these capacities don't pop up overnight. You have to build them and uh, inculcate them. So this takes time. And even after doing all of that, it is not the case that we will not be dealing with China in economic terms. I mean, it is a part, a very important part of the world economy. And even then, we will have uh, to deal with it. The key thing is, do we or do we not have uh, 
enough bulwarks in order to be able to defend our national interests. And I will argue that we are slowly but steadily building in that direction. Okay, we know you've had a long and stressful day. We won't hold you back any longer. Hopefully, we'll have you back after the budget. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank and you. we enjoyed that press conference. You were able to bring things together well. So, nicely done. Compliments and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>